Thanking everyone and reconvene the hearings. So if I could have just ask you to stop your conversations, please. Thank you. And at this stage of the hearing, we're hearing from Chris Sides. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I first want to say I stand by submission and believe that the facts and arguments are correct and should be accepted by the commissioners. I've read Mr. Goff's report, and most of what I'm saying today is a response to his response to mine. I read Mr. Goff's report of the 13th April. It contains some very valuable analysis. His central conclusion, which seems to be beyond dispute, is that the surface aquifer, the Owyte Canal catchment, and the deep aquifer, the Otakiri aquifer, have no hydraulic connection. The two water bodies are independent. A confined aquifer is confined, and that is why Cresswell and Nongfu are here today. Two consequences follow. The Owyte groundwater will be unaffected so the 220 to 231 bores will be unaffected. I accept that conclusion subject to no land subsidence. The Otakiri Aquifer is an independent aquifer, and therefore the Regional Council calculations of the Owyte recharge and the groundwater allocation are irrelevant to calculating appropriate allocation for the Otakiri Aquifer. And that figure on page 367, which implies that the whole water withdrawal is trivial, is really a nonsense. <clears throat> the correct groundwater allocation with the Odakiri Aquifer will be 35% of the Odakiri's recharge minus its uh, evaporation, which is nil, minus outflow to the ocean. Outflow to the sea is unknown and unknowable. So the key measure is the recharge rate. And no party, Cresswell, the Regional Council, or Mr. Goff, have offered any information whatsoever on the recharge rate for the uh, Odakiri Aquifer. It is therefore impossible for any party to begin to calculate a GAA. I submit that no allocation should be granted until the recharge has been established. Now, pressure in the aquifer. Saltwater intrusion is determined by the relative pressure of saltwater and freshwater. Extraction of any water from a confined aquifer must reduce pressure downstream. The pump water must come from a reduction of storage within the aquifer. It's a bit mind-boggling that the fresh water is being subtracted from 200 metres below sea level. It may be assumed that the Odakiri Aquifer has been in equilibrium for maybe thousands of years and certainly for at least seven centuries. <coughs> That's since the Kaharoa eruption. The intrusion of a dozen bores must have some effect on that equilibrium. The test of safe volume to extract has been based on observing only a minor drop in aquifer pressure after one week's flow. Mr. Goff has quite an emphasis on the hydraulic head. But the assumption that pressure equals volume is open to challenge. The pressure results from, alti the pressure results from alt altitude difference between the point of recharge and the point of measurement. The point of recharge is unknown. Speculation suggests Lake Tarawera, but I know of no observation to support it. And the determinants of the volume available are the permeability of the materials, the width and depth of the aquifer, the length of the aquifer, that's the distance from, between the recharge point and the abstraction point, because water runs on a, in a confined situation runs on this equation that volume, that's volume per over time or rate of flow, is the square root of pressure by diameter over length by friction. You will have noticed that these are all unknowns. A hint of the importance of these factors is Odakiri Springs declaration on its website that what makes this water so special is being 50 years old. 
That means it takes 50 years for water to travel from the recharge point, wherever that is, to the extraction point at Odakiri. So rate of flow is a huge issue. I submit that input to the system must be understood before permits are issued for outputs. Mr. Goss, paragraph 41, states the framework and says, for an expert assessment of these issues, the key potential adverse effects are the lowering of groundwater levels, which is really pressure in a confined aquifer, saline intrusion and subsidence. In some ways, my submission was provoked by the omission of these in the assessment of environmental effects. So I'm glad that it's now become a recognised issue. Mr. Goss, paragraphs 56 and 70, say that saline intrusion is not likely to occur. Not likely concedes it is possible and that it is a recognised hazard. I'm intrigued to know what not likely means and why it means the issue can be avoided. If you are in forestry, getting killed is not likely, but it happens and it's irreversible. The justification for a piney not likely is that the site is 14 kilometres from the coast, but any advance in the interface between the salt water and fresh water is saline intrusion, and so an alteration in the quality of groundwater. Secondly, most, probably most, of the land between Odakiri and the coast is below sea level and does not contribute to avoiding saline intrusion near Odakiri. Thirdly, sea level is rising and will continue to rise and regional councils are required to take this into account. I might add that the, if you calculate it, that Odakiri is 10 metres above sea level and 14 k's from the sea, that means that the gradient of the river is 1 in 1,400, or a gradient of point zero 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 seven. Now there's a very slow movement and very high set, which gives high sedimentation. Only a little subsidence in the river might stop flowing altogether. And that creates an intriguing scenario that the Awaiti catchment will fill up and become Tarawera Lake number two. Mr. Goff's paragraphs 57 and 71, settlement and subsidence are not likely. Again, this is a concession that there are possible adverse effects and that they're a recognised hazard. I believe settlement and subsidence are not merely likely, but certain. I object to Ms. Cranswick's summary of not likely as Mr. Goff concludes salt water intrusion and subsidence will be avoided. I am saying very firmly they will not be avoided. These are reasons. Observation worldwide is that extracting water from aquifers is associated with subsidence. I put in a thing on the 20th of April with an attachment to uh, listing places where subsidence has occurred. There's unanimous geologist assessment of the Rangitaiki Plain is that settlement and subsidence have been occurring for over 300,000 years and will continue. I submitted Dr. Nairn's paper uh, on the 20th of April. As for lithology, the cores and Jilla's notes record soft, wet alluvium all the way down to the Ignam Ride. This is certain to shrink whether due to water being extracted or shaken in earthquakes. The land in the Hawaii catchment sank two metres in 1987. I was actually told by a senior engineer at Tasman that their bores there, they had substantial subsidence. 
so much enough to put the paper machine out of queue. Earthquakes are the main reason for the play, uh, uh, occasion for the plane to sink. Mr. Goff's paragraph 63 stated the project site is not located on any known active faults. I would remind you that both the Edgecombe and Darfield faults were unknown until the earthquakes happened. I direct your attention to the maps of faults in Dr. Nairn's paper. The Rangitag and he says, the Rangitagi plain is recognised one of the most seismically complex and active areas in New Zealand, where the North Island fault system intersects with the type of volcanic zone. So you get both right and left hand punches. You can assume that the earthquakes, you, you cannot presume that earthquakes in the not likely, are in the not likely category. If you refer to attachment three, that's the GNS report on the Hikarangi Trench disruption. The conclusion is the ruptures in the Gisborne Kumara section occur, recur surprisingly regularly at 70 year intervals. The last event was March and May 1947. So that is an interesting number to calculate. <coughs> and uh, 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 that same report includes maps of the earthquake intensity and tsunami size for the Rangitaiki Plain. So you don't think the Hikarangi Trench is irrelevant. And then there are the Wakatani and Waiho faults that stretch all the way to Wellington and beyond. And the longer the faults, the greater the punch. And then there's a fault, interestingly enough, known as the Odakiri Fault, which is only a few k uh, north of the site. And there's the Rongoma Pakao faults, Rotama Pakao faults, which are right closer still at Onapu. So I suggest that the commissioners are required to accept the precautionary approach in reaching an appropriate decision. The precautionary approach is appropriate because the number of scientific uncertainties, which are actually unknowns, and because the irreversibility of both saltwater intrusion and subsidence. The unknowns are the site of recharge, the rate of recharge, the rate of flow, the disturbance of aqua equilibrium by water extraction and alteration of pressures at the freshwater saltwater interface, sea level rise, the timing of earthquakes, the size and location of those earthquakes. And I'll quote, New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement Number Three. It is when the risk of significant adverse or irreversible environment effects cannot be adequately assessed because of uncertainty about the nature and consequences of human activities or other processes, which for me includes earthquakes, that are adequately assessed the, uh, because of uncertainty. Oh, we've done that bit. Uh, that a precautionary approach to risk management becomes appropriate. If there is uncertainty, risk avoidance becomes appropriate. Ms. Cranswick suggests the CPS does not apply to matters in this hearing, but the CPS preamble includes activities inland kind of a major impact on coastal water quality. And that's precisely what salt water intrusion is about. Ms. Cranswick's proposed draft condition number eight, or paragraph eight, is unacceptable. It suggests that the, any adverse effects, the consent can be reviewed in the event of any adverse effects, that, but they have to prove it is a result of the exercise of this consent and that will never be provable. The whole of paragraph eight amounts to a proposal for adaptive management. As national policy rules, adaptive management is inappropriate where effects cannot be remedied before they're irreversible. And very quickly, the last two paragraphs of my submission, the contaminated discharge into Hallett Drain 
Mr. Kieran Miller has proposed tight controls and methodology that would improve dilution of pollution. But having heard Ms. Conning speaking for Forest and Bird, I actually would go with her views. And on the road haulage, I appear to be totally unique in suggesting that the railway should be used when it's there. In fact, the railway crossing has been a subject of considerable uh, debate and comment. Uh, on the road haulage and economic enhancement for the community, the Ministry of Transport has recently published data on accidents involving trucks for the 2016 years. I will quote that. Trucks were involved in 23% of all deaths and 7% of all injuries on the roads. In 2016, 75 people died and 850 were injured in crashes involving trucks. Trucks make up 6% of the tra distance travelled. Compare that with the 23% of deaths. On these figures, several people will die and around 35 will be injured in the 17 years of this consent. And almost all that cost will fall in the community and almost none on Cresswell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sides. We'll see if we have questions for you. Um, thank you, Mr. Sides. Um, I'm just wondering if, you, if you're able to um, let me know some of your background, because you've provided quite a quite an in-depth submission on some technical matters. I was just wondering what your background is in terms of... I studied statistics at postgraduate level in London at University College. Uh, that's where I get my framework for looking at mm. things in terms of certainty and uncertainty and error and measuring your errors and so forth. Mm. And. Um, the other thing is I own a block of land on the Rangitaiki Plains on which, and so I've been the sort of university of life on that one in that we put in irrigation, which is where I've got a lot of my kind of knowledge about water pressures and volumes and so forth. Uh, we always put in drainage where I've got knowledge about how water flows through the Rangitaiki Plains. And, uh, yeah, that's really it. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, we've had the benefit of a panel of receiving uh, expert uh, evidence on Monday, and you may not have been here um, when Mr. Goff presented evidence, but he did um, talk to or respond to a couple of your points that you've raised uh, in your submissions, and they were specifically saline intrusion um, and from my understanding is that uh, from what he has, he has prepared is is confirmed that the site is 14 kilometers from the coast um, and there's significant hydraulic hidden areas down the gradient of the site which you, you've mentioned um, and there was there's a the artesian water layers are at least 15 meters above the land surface at the area of the project and that's, that's agreed with the Regional Council and its technical review, and, and I take it your view is, is different from what you've explained to us. Oh, no, I agree. Yes. The, um, the hydraulic head <clears throat> is at 15 uh, metres significant. The point is there is a change in the hydraulic head once you pump this water out. There's a reduction of storage within the aquifer, and it is absolutely certain that you pump water at one point, the water beyond that will be at a lower pressure. And then you have the problem that seawater is heavier than fresh water. And so it is bound to intrude if pressure is reduced. It's about disturbing the equilibrium that must have been established before. Actually, to go more detailed into that, uh, Mr. Goff, in his uh, um, appendix called NDG2, um, gives quite good graphs of the Thais theoretical model and 
the measurements that they actually got when they pumped at Otakiri, and they don't match. If you look at those graphs, you'll see there's a figure, one line of measurements here, the theoretical ones, and the other one, the line of measurements that are the actual ones. And to get the theory model to match the actual measurements, they had to reduce the, the things called S and T, which are storativity and transmissivity, which are horrible words, and I didn't use them, but Mr. Thice and so on do. The, um, they had to reduce the transmissivity figure to a quarter and the storativity figure to a tenth to get the two sets of data to match. It's actually mentioned in Mr. Goff's thing, I think at paragraph 81 or thereabouts, that um, he said it was the conservative modeling that caused the two figures to come together. But it's another example of the utter uncertainty you have about what size the Odekiri aquifer really is. There's no evidence whatever as to the size of the aquifer. Uh, you can have a very small aquifer at high pressure, or you can have a very big aquifer at high pressure. But there's no evidence from anyone as to the size of this aquifer. It's a bit like if you're blindfolded, you put a bucket in, you fill it up, and you wouldn't know whether you're drawing your bucket from a fish pond or from a swimming pool. The bucket will fill at the same rate, but unfortunately your fish pond will empty very quickly. And that is the risk with the Ildikiri aquifer, when you know nothing about the recharge rate. And this 50 years is an awful symbol of the something odd going on. Um, my other question is around uh, land subsidence. And I think that I just want to clarify this is we you disagree with Mr. Goff. His, his view is that land subsidence is not likely to occur, and, and you're saying that it certainly will occur. Well, it's certain to occur. Yeah. The planes have been sinking. I mean, this is why Edgecombe flooded last year. The... The planes okay, are so, sinking. So, sorry, Mr. Um, um, sorry, Mr. Sides. I was just wanted to confirm that's that's the area of your disagreement, because I think you've explained your view quite mm -hmm. clearly. Um, if, if it's okay with you, we can move move to my last question. Um, this was regards to. You'll have to come back to me. I've lost it. Okay. Mr. Sides, I'm unclear um, why you're concerned about earthquakes in relation to the application mm. before us. Because the planes sink when they're shaken. Yes. The, and therefore earthquakes are a major issue. The sinking happens almost entirely during earthquakes. I mean, they say there's an average sinking of four millimetres a year for hundreds of thousands of years. But it doesn't sink that little bit each year. It happens when there's an earthquake. The, the shaking causes subsidence and you get liquefaction and that sort of thing at the surface. And I understand but, all of that, but how does that relate to this application? Because if the land sinks, all the... Well, this example I gave about the fact that the river will therefore sink and how does that relate to this application? The, this will add a human element to the natural processes that are going on. And the human element will exacerbate what is going on. For instance, if you take this one million... No, I think I understand now, so I'll put it back to you. So your submission to us is that the Rangitaki Plains are subsiding, earthquakes are part of the cause of that, 
and that your view is this application will induce additional subsidence which would be added to that occurring naturally. Is that in a nutshell? That would be right, yes, okay. sir. Okay, no, thank you very much for that. I remember my last question, sorry about that, Mr Chair. Um, my last one is, in your original submission, you had, um, in terms of what relief might be sought if it was approved, you'd said that you wanted a condition requiring use of the railway for transport. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gives reasons later, and then you've included that in the submission you've given us today. So I, I just wanted to clarify what you meant by using the railway, because we've been to the site, we've seen where the railway is, that it, it, it doesn't appear to be double tracking or a siding uh, anywhere nearby. So when you said you are saying that you wanted to, the applicant to use the railway, what did you mean by that? I meant that they should have a little siding into the place onto the work site so the, the, the containers would be loaded directly onto the trucks and then a whole train load of them would go off. Oh, it happens already from Cabra, when you get a train with a complete, whatever it is, 80 containers on it. So you're suggesting the taking of land, the construction of a siding from the current railway to the application site. That's. I'm just just trying to clarify exactly. Yes, yeah, so I mean, the the length of the railway is a matter of only hundreds of meters. Yeah. And you just put it on. You won't need all the land that they currently have. For I don't know. There are 92 truck movements. I'm not sure how many actual trucks that would involve. But there's presently must have 30 or 40 trucks in mind to be whizzing around on site. And that would instead just get replaced by uh, forklift trucks, which are need anyway. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Sides. No further questions from us. Thank you. Thank you. The next submitter on my list is Sarah Vanderboom. Welcome. Morning. Dina Koto. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I'm not sure if you were here this morning. We no, you... I haven't been here over the last uh, few days. That's right. So I've just said to um, submitters that we've read the submissions that were submitted. Uh, we've read them, so you don't need to reread them to us. But yeah. you're very welcome to highlight your key concerns for it. Yeah, that's exactly what I've done. Yeah. Great. So I'm assuming that you have read it all yeah. and taken the detail. Yeah. So Great. I just want to skim over the things that are really important to me about the place that I live. Yeah, that'd and be good. Thank you. Okay. So we chose to move to Ōtukiri in mid-2016, having saved for over 20 years to be able to afford property in rural Whakatane. So we live on the southern boundary. We share about half of um, Ōtukiri Springs' southern boundary. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's a dream fulfilled. I, c I couldn't have found a place that's better for, for me, for my family, and it's definitely is a long-term dream to be there. We love the greenery, the rural views, the peace and quiet, the bird life, the night sky, which is outstanding, the animals, rural people and country activities. The proposed development threatens most of these values. Yes, I am, an, I am a NIMBY. You can put that label on me, I'm not ashamed of it. I don't want this in my backyard. If this application is successful on our northern boundary and within 100 metres of our house, we will have a 30-month construction phase with heavy machinery, large-scale earthworks and building developments with noise levels higher than are per permitted within the rural plains zone. Well, this 30-month construction phase, <coughs> during which earth earthworks will release hazardous dust laden with arsenic, cadmium, copper and zinc, the prevailing northerlies will carry this directly onto our land, animals, water supply, our food, our home and our family. We'll have 30 months of unspecified construction traffic. Once operational, we'll have a container terminal with some 234 containers right on our boundary. Think of the noise of the port of Tauranga and consider this as your neighbour. We'll have a seven hectare 12.9 metre high industrial plant running 24-7 uh, with various in industrial activities, industrial lighting, hundreds of people, machines, forklifts, heavy trucks and vehicles, all again within 100 metres of our home. 
We will have multiple south-facing loading bays with trucks, forklifts, people, lights, etc. We'll have exterior lighting and staff movements on site across the whole seven hectare site, all night, every night. Weekends in our garden, evening barbecues and working on our property will be with a backdrop of industrial noise and shipping container movements. We'll have over 300 new vehicle movements each day on our quiet, dead-end country road. This equates to a vehicle every two minutes during daylight hours and a heavy truck every three minutes. This is along Johnson Road where our kids walk and ride to school, where we exercise our dogs and our horses. And I want you to note too that the applicant has not accounted for the traffic volumes during construction, nor the service vehicles during normal operation, so traffic loading will likely be even higher than this. These changes, honestly, will ruin my home life and my rural lifestyle. I work from home, as do many of my neighbours. These impacts will affect me 24-7. I feel that the social costs to all who live nearby have been considered of lesser value than all other factors. Yet these social factors underpin the reasons why people buy in the rural environment and buy rural lifestyle properties in the first place. The small community of Hallett and Johnson Roads will bear the bulk of the negative impacts, while the com wider community reaps the arguable benefits of this development. I am also a note, not over there either. Our precious groundwater should be safeguarded. In much of this region, our fresh surface water is too polluted to drink. In some areas, it's too polluted to swim in or even use for irrigation. The cleanest, purest water that remains is underground. It is ludicrous to give this precious taonga to an international comp company so that they can improve their profits. The whole of life impact of Nongfu's product is, frankly, obscene. Groundwater is extracted from the aquifer, which, as we've heard, our experts don't know the exact source of this aquifer or its rate of recharge. Purification processes send large quantities of water, this water, to waste. Cleaning processes deposit toxins into the wastewater and ultimately our, the applicant is proposing into our local waterways. The bottling process creates 154,000 bottles per hour. That's 24-7, so that's 3.5 million bottles per day, 1.35 billion bottles per year. China currently recycles less than 10% of its plastic waste due to a worldwide plastic glut. Most of this waste will be dumped in landfills and waterways. This development is incompatible with the rural plains zone. As I've mentioned, I've pulled out um, three rules in my submissions. We've got objective rule one, which is to sustain the productive potential of rural land and provide for rural production activities. Um, prior to WDC's current district plan, intensive lifestyle block development was permitted in the Hallett and Johnson Road area. Um, so we've got very, some really small lifestyle blocks up to four, eight, uh, four to five hectares. Um, and they've enabled this in many parts of the plains. Because of the loss of productive land via these subdivisions, the new district plan sets four hectares as the minimum lot size. This development will remove seven hectares of productive land. So this is apparently now, this rule is apparently now unimportant and this land can be turned into an industrial site. Objective rule uh, two is to maintain and where appropriate enhance rural character. As I've talked about in my lifestyle changes, this large scale industrial development does not fit with protection of rural character. Objective rule three, to ensure that development is located and operated to enable people and communities to provide for their social, economic and cultural wellbeing, for their health and safety while ensuring that adverse effects, including cumulative effects on the rural environment, are avoided, remedied or mitigated. I think that rule is really self-explanatory in that it, this proposed development is incompatible with that rule. And I ask you, what is the point of the protections within the rural plain zone if large-scale industrialisation is actually possible? I'd also argue that this is a new activity versus expansion, and I'd challenge the applicant's reverse sensitivity argument. Yes, I bought next to an existing water bottling plant, a very small water bottling plant that is contained within several tin sheds. 
No, this does not give the owners of the small water bottling plant any special rights to expand this plant into a large scale industrial plant. This is like saying that someone who bought a home next to the local dairy should expect that dairy to become a multi-hectare shopping mall in the future and have no rights to oppose it. Because of the vast difference in scale, the application should be deemed a new activity and not given any special rights as an existing activity. Um, and this includes any rights under reverse sensitivity rules. The predominant land use in this area is farming, horticulture and lifestyle blocks. WDC enabled this intensive lifestyle block development and it's happy to take the increased rates yield that comes with this. The impacts on nearby lifestyle block owners will not be less than minor and I've outlined just the, the um, bare bones of the impacts on me and on my family. WDC should not allow this large scale industrial development in an area where it has already given permission for in intensive lifestyle block development. The land uses are clearly incompatible and WDC should have considered this in its zoning rules. I also want to make the point the original application for Otakiri Springs included a small handful of neighbours. There are no records of any consultation. We've been told by long term residents that fewer than five people were asked and some of those people actually had to push really hard to be involved in any of that consultation. As it was not publicly notified, the community has not at any point given or implied permission that expansion of such an activity is acceptable. On the subject of stormwater and wastewater discharge, we don't think that any discharge is acceptable from this site. Seeing neighbours and locals submerged in the April 2017 floods, it's unacceptable to discharge any stormwater at all into the nearby environment. The applicant's proposed treated wastewater uh, would include, and this is from their application, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, periacetic acid, sodium hypochlorite, sodium bisulfate and sodium hydroxide. Under no circumstances should these enter our waterways. Wastewater should be dealt with on, on site as all other rural land users must do. We're, also, we're supportive of the Regional Council's uh, rules around no activities within the stop bank zone. And I want to refer to the promised benefits and um, really just to share a cautionary tale. This is from Blue Springs in Patararu. Now, the Blue Springs ap application to develop a water bottling plant in Patararu was declined. The applicant provided projected employment data of some 200 jobs, as well as a local spend in the millions. And this was based on an economic impact study completed by Burl, who also completed the economic impact study um, from which the applicants have referred, uh, have pulled data from. South Waikato District Council did their own independent assessment and found that the actual number of jobs would number just eight. So from 200 jobs to eight. My message is take the applicant's job and economic impact proje projections with a large grain of salt. Now on the subject of the applicant, Nongfu has not come to New Zealand with the intention of creating jobs for New Zealanders or caring for our environment. They are here to fleece our precious natural resource at no cost and make billions out of it. That's all from me. Now you've been reading from some tight notes. Can we get a copy of those notes? Please? Yes, I can leave these with you. Thanks. That's why I stopped writing because I thought I'd just get your notes. Questions? Um, I, I've been asking each of the residents around what they consider to be the rural character of the area, but I've, I'm just mentioning that. I, I'm not going to necessarily ask you because I think you've actually articulated yeah, I think both I in put your that in my submission and, and yeah. also today. So, but if there was, I'd just offer the opportunity if there was anything you thought you'd missed in terms of the rural character. No, topic. it's everything I described in those Thank first you. couple of paragraphs. I didn't have another question. In terms of the <coughs> impacts that you're worried about in terms of um, what I might call rural amenity that you currently enjoy, you may have heard me, I'm, I'm not sure if you did hear me ask earlier submitters about if they were concerned more about weekend activities than weekday activities. So a question to you is in terms of hours of operation and days of the week, are particular times or particular days of the week of more concern to you than others? I think because I work from home, I'm there 24-7. I'm either out in the paddocks or I'm in my office, mm -hmm. or, or, or just conducting normal home activities all day, every day. Mm -hmm. I don't go to town to work, so it's going to impact me every, every part of every day. So 
hours of operation, zero would be my preferred outcome. Certainly, I think um, if this does go ahead, I think you need to look at um, reasonable hours for families to conduct their socialising, their family time, barbecue time, farm work, um, exercise activities, all of those, consider all of those. All right, thank you very much. I have no further questions, and that largely is because of your um, written material and the material you provide today is pretty fulsome, so no need to clarify. Don't forget to give Shari a copy of those notes. Yeah. And if you have an electronic copy, if you could email them. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Our next submitter on the list, Jared Casey, Eastern Bay Chamber of Commerce. Morena. Morning. Good morning. Apologise uh, for the quality of my voice. I've come down with that um, thing that only males get. So, sorry, what's that? Yeah, we, well, we don't get a lot of oh, sympathy. Man. So, um, I just I understand that you have read our our submission. Yes. Just a couple of things that I really wanted to reinforce is you know the purpose of the Chamber of Commerce is to work with business and agencies to contribute to economic and social growth for the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Um, the water bottling has been identified as a potential to bring additional jobs and economic growth to this district within the Regional Council and the Regional Growth Strategy. Yep. The applicant has stated that the proposed development will, will create up to 80 full-time jobs, but it's not only the impact that it will have uh, at Otakiri and the Water Springs, there will be additional jobs with construction Etc., and that'll flow through to the wider economy. As, as there's more people employed, there'll be more sustainability and economic growth and business growth for our, our businesses in here as well. Finally, just want to reinforce that um, the Chamber of Commerce understands the discussion about environmental, cultural, and sustainability issues. This isn't an area that we, or that I'm qualified to comment on, and it's not an area of expertise. Mm. But we will. And we've asked that you're mindful of those issues when doing this. Yep. And just as a point of clarification, that um, through the edge of floods, I just wanted to acknowledge the support that we had from Otakiri Springs when the water was, was not available. Uh, I was able to contact Otakiri Springs and, and ask for some assistance in providing water for those residents and people who are impacted. Um, Otakiri Springs provided 18,000 litres of bottled water to get that through, so, um, and they didn't want any public acknowledgement on that, but just wanted to thank them and what they've done with that. So that's the end of my submission. Thank you very much for that. Questions? Um, you, your timing for submission is good. You would have heard uh, one of the residents just in the, in the last, it was our last submitter, and it's been a theme of several of the submitters this morning questioning the number of full-time equivalents that might be attributed to the proposal. Um, and certainly you're one of our few submitters from a, you know, an economic development perspective and, and the mandate of your organisation, and I wondered if you had any comment in regards to that. Um, you, I, you know, I find it's, it's a really interesting discussion. We, we find that there's reports which will suggest that 80 that 80 jobs will be created, then someone else finds another report would say that's bollocks and that they're going to end up with two or three. Oh. Um, you know, I'm inclined to to say whatever, you know, if there is, you know, I understand there's $50 million going to be invested in this region. Where else in this region has, has anyone decided to invest $50 million into this region? There's no one stepping up to the plate and doing that. This region needs support and economic and business growth. And so, Yes, I, you know, I think we can find all sorts of reports that will say, yes, this is going to be that and this will be that. You know, we're just going to argue back and forth. And the, the challenge that, that I've had and that we've had probably, that, that there is an emotional discussion on this and there's a logical discussion. We've, we're trying to sit with the logical discussion in there and take the emotion out of it. 
have, you, have you had a chance to have a look at the economic assessment that was part of the application? Yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, from from our reading, it seems it seems to stack up. But I haven't gone and looked at the the other ones, which says, look, there's only going to be five jobs or six jobs done. Mm. You know, I've looked at the work that Creswell has provided. We haven't gone and looked and said, do we need to find something that contradicts what their report is? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Mr. Casey. No further questions. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Next submitter on the list, Glenn Fraser. Morning. Morning. You've been here on other days, so you know Morning. the form. Morning, everyone. What's that? You've been here <laughs> on other days, so you know the procedure. Oh, yes, I was here for... Um, yes. So I'm the husband of um, Maureen, who spoke yesterday. Yes. And um, so I'm, and uh, got a young son, Seth, as well. Um, actually, I've just got a couple of uh, pictures. Okay. I'm just going to provide a couple of pictures. Um, okay, good. So, um, I do live next door to the proposed um, industrial site um, at 408 Hallett Road, but that is not why I'm talking now. I'm not a conf confrontational speaker, but what spurred me to speak today is hearing yesterday claims being made that the land in the vicinity of the Otakiri spring site is unproductive. This is incorrect. It is highly productive horticultural quality land. As evidence of this, I quote my own soil test carried out by Hill Laboratories in 2016, which says the soil is high in organic matter and suitable for crop production. Before the SuperValue supermarket closed because of the 2017 flood, I was supplying that local supermarket with spray-free produce and the pictures provided. Um, all, all grown by myself. I expect that they were very happy with the quality, quality of our produce and the supply will start again when this supermarket reopens. As a qualified and experienced horticulturist who grew up on orchards and cropping farms in Hooks Bay and still have shares in orchards there, I want to say that the land all over the Rangitaiki Plains, including Otakiri, is well suited to an expansion of the horticultural industry. <coughs> there is a real growth opportunity for this industry, both fruit production and vegetables. This region could easily be much more part of that growth. I'm saying let's be very sure before we go scaling up the water bottling industry and blotching the rural landscape with industrial factories, sucking out valuable water that would support a horticultural industry, amongst other things. Um, horticulture, unlike water bottling, puts its water back into the soil, right next to where it comes out. Fact. The number of jobs created from horticulture would leave the water bottling industry in its wake. Asparagus, kumara, kiwi fruit, stone fruit, berry fruit have all been grown very successfully in the Otakiri district. I refer to my own submission where we have been in discussions with a blueberry export company uh, based in Taronga who are very keen for us to plant our property in blueberries under shade cloth. There's a new large blueberry that's come out which is um, <coughs> suitable for our region. But we're very cautious about making this investment while the possibility of a huge industrial site with toxins possibly leaching into the soil next door into our property hangs over us. The land where we live is zoned rural and should stay that way. An expanding horticulture industry is in fitting with this, but an industrial factory is not. Organic horticulture is, as we all know, an expanding part of the New Zealand horticultural industry. Overall, the growing of produce without chemicals is becoming more and more sustainable as time goes on. 
An increase in orchards and productive market gardens in any district will add value to neighbouring properties and all properties in the region in general. Whereas a large scale industrial water bottling plant, or plants if we're considering the wider district, will likely devalue properties and add no real value to the district. There are sandbags being used up the road here as we speak to clean up a toxic waterway due to industry in the past. Do we want to risk adding more toxicity to other local waterways? Your children and mine will be left with the environmental mess due to poor decision making by our generation. This district actually has a bad track record of industry being allowed to contaminate waterways. Let's continue to turn the tide as councils locally have started to do and say no to industrial scale operations in our productive rural areas. Um, local councils have started cleaning up the waterways, which I acknowledge has been very good. An industrial plant um, of the scale proposed by Creswell should only be built in the Whakatane District Council's 3.1.13 zone description of the district plan, labelled industrial zone. The next point I would like to make surrounds the area of regional employment. Before I went on to set up my own business, carrying out work on lifestyle properties in the district, I worked as a truck driver for Lynn Fox out of the fully robotic tissue factory in Kararau. Most of the Lynn Fox drivers are based at Kararau, but the issue was there was not enough staff available locally, not just to drive trucks, but also to work on site, shifting containers and carrying out office duties. They were offering to train people as well. I also have a friend who is a field manager with a local kiwi fruit packhouse company who has said they have had big problems in this area recently finding orchard staff. After kiwi fruit harvest, the staff can go on to prune kiwi fruit, which provides a flow on of work. Based on this kind of genuine information, I find it hard to believe that we need to build industrial businesses on productive rural land and to provide a small amount of extra employment when there is already a shortage of workers to support our existing rural businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. We'll see if we have questions for you. Uh, I've been asking, you would have heard I've been asking all of this uh, resident submitters uh, what they consider to be rural character. And you did um, just mention that earlier and you were talking about the rural zone and the activities that you thought were appropriate there. Were there, yeah. were there any others that you wanted to add to that? No. Okay. So I didn't have that question. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any other okay. You mentioned had um, soil testing done for mm. your land yes. by Hill Laboratories. What was yep. the CEC cation exchange capacity of your soil? What was the what, sir? CEC cation exchange capacity of your soil, which is the applicant's concern about the limitation on their land. Oh, okay. I would have to refer to my um, soil test. Yeah, if you could go I home. I can't answer that off hand. That's all right. Yeah. Could you look that up and just let Shari know? Yep, no problem. Yeah, that'd be in, I'd be interested in that. Yep, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry, I just had a question. I just want to just double confirm. I'm, I'm assuming these are on your property? The, the sorry, yes, yep. So Both just giving an example there of... Um, yep. oh, they got one picture, but not... No, um, it's double-sided. Double-sided. We've got them double-sided. Double -sided, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, cool. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. That's cool, yeah. All good. Um, yes, yeah, so getting back to that question, um, yes, they are my property, um, our property, which is right adjacent to the uh, proposed um, industrial site oh, there expansion. Cool. Thank you. Uh, yep, so very successfully growing produce there, productive land. Yep, <laughs> no, that's good. What's this? You want to open it? Um, so that, what's, sorry, that what's, back what's picture. What's that one, the little green shoot? I took that this morning, <laughs> yep. Um, it's an example of four days before the rain last week, um, I planted oats as a winter cover crop. Okay. Um, and they've come out of the ground already, and I'm very happy with the way they're looking. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, good. Man. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Thank you. Now, I understand, uh, Potaki, you wish to go before lunch. 
Yeah, come on up. That's fine. Tuatahi mamaua e tukunatu ngā mihi ki a kōrua ko tai mai nei kei wenga nei a tātou e mihi kawana a ki ngā hapu o ngā ti awa i tai mai nei i ngā rā i te whakaputa ngā kōrero ki a mātou nō rera he mihi kawana ki a kōtou muri e ngā tangata whenua i whakaputa ngā kōro i whakawhiriwhiri ngā kōro e pāna ki tēnei kaupapa Kia ora, good morning. Um, we've had the benefit of having a large group yesterday uh, from Ngāti, uh, Ngāti Awa, um, Tūwhari Tō ki Kaurau ki Tai and a number of other groups that were yesterday. So we um, took care of all the protocols in terms of the hearing yesterday. Uh, so, so this is peace of mind in terms of the, the hearing has been cleared for all of those who wish to speak in terms of the tangata whenua issues. Uh, so just wanted to welcome you here today. Kia ora. Tēnā Thank you for the welcome. Uh, my name's Arthur Frontoff and this is Martire Duncan. We um, represent the Napotiki Resource Management Unit. Uh, Napotiki lands go from Rangatoa Bay to Waitau to Papamoa. And we fuck a papa to uh, Ngati Awa. Yeah, I'm just going to read this, yeah, but you, you'll get a copy of this as well. No, we do, so you just read it out. That's yeah. great. Uh, once upon a time, we could drink the water from our streams, then we had to rely on drinking water from the tap. Now we see the beginnings of our country of, to having to buy our drinking water in bottles. Is this the direction we want to be heading? I ask that you consider the unknowns and the evidence where the writers have commented about issues they are not able to speak to or lacks further evidence or are outside the scope of the RMA or other plans. Now, Pūtiki views these issues as conversations we need to begin to have. For Māori, all things are connected. Our knowledge, or my tauranga, comes from our experiences and understanding of relationships. In this case, these need thorough exploration. We ask that you consider things beyond the books and to consider broader factors and that you take a whole-of-life approach from the cradle to the grave. In the last 25 years and more recently, there has been enormous geopolitical restructuring driven by the recognition that the governance and ownership rights over natural resources was guaranteed to Māori under the Treaty of Waitangi, coupled with the realisation of injustices caused by dispossession, impoverishment through European colonisation. Both major political parties have agreed to restitution measures that include opening up space for Māori to participate in the management of natural resources. Māori have stepped up to this challenge by ensuring our customary ownership rights, practices and knowledges are made known and are reflected in the resource management space. For the last 140 years, Māori planning approaches and practices have occupied a space outside the institutional framework through the process of deliberate colonial exclusion. Since 1967, the private property regime has been replaced by state monopoly over water allocation and pollution rights. For nearly half a century, state played a pivotal role in fostering industry in order to carve a comfortable niche within the global economy. The Tasman pulp and paper mill discharged waste into the Tarawera River faced protests from locals and iwis, and yet in 2009, resource consent was renewed to allow discharge into the river for another 25 years. Intensification of agricultural and horticultural practices has severely affected the quantity and quality of water resources. These adverse environmental impacts of fresh water lay squarely at the feet of the councils that allow it to occur. They are, frankly, the result of poor decisions and market failure. Irrigation uses 78% of our available water resources. We need to protect the remainder for our people, not the water miners to profit from and who look to purchase properties that carry a water take consent. The argument that the volume of water we would be giving away is minute is irrelevant. It contributes to the total volume of potable water available to our communities. Chlorination and chemical treatments of town supplies are becoming more commonplace as our water resources become increasingly compromised. Northland, where people rely on rainwater to fill their tanks, locals are forced to pay the cost of water delivery while bottling plants to take out pure groundwater for free. Recent modelling and forecasting of climate changes predict that the whole east coast of New Zealand will become hotter and drier, which would undoubtedly increase demands for water in the area. 
we consider that our deep aquifers, while remaining relatively untapped, afford New Zealand a form of insurance for clean, potable water way into the future. Climate change will inevitably have an impact on the hydrological system. The Whakatane catchment will see the greatest changes in the Bay of Plenty. They will see the current 22 days a year of temperatures over 25 degrees Celsius to increase to 47 days in the next 20 years. And that will double before the end of the century. There will be fewer frost. The current five days a year frost will be reduced to one or two in the next 20 years. And by the end of the century will occur once every five years. Winters are expected to get drier, 10% less rain overall. The rains will be heavy, leading to more flood events. Summer will either be a very dry season or a very wet one. Which summers those will be is unclear. It is predicted that sea levels will rise one metre for every decade. This will lead to saltwater intrusion into groundwater systems and will hinder extraction of fresh water from coastal aquifers. In the Coromandel and parts of the Canterbury coast, groundwater demands have resulted in saltwater intrusion and localised microbial and nitrate contamination of septic tanks that have been recorded. In Havelock North, three people lost their lives and 5,000 became severely ill due to diffused contamination of their town water supply. The regional plan as evidence only addresses flooding provision that is covered in the planning documents. And district planner Keith Friends in his evidence makes no reference to the impacts of climate change on groundwater quality, quality and quantity. Now Portiki considers climate change the biggest environmental issue of this generation. And for it to be attributed an inconsequential consideration reflects a different approach to resource management. Globally, water is becoming scarce. While some areas of New Zealand may have an abundance now, we cannot assume this will continue. Water is valuable and needs to be valued. Other countries don't gift their water to private enterprise. In fact, New Zealand is the only country in the world that allows our water to be exploited for private profit at no cost per litre. We need to future-proof our water resources now, before they become a commodity and before any more consents to bottled water are issued. Five days ago, more than 115,000 signatures were presented to Environment Canterbury, calling for two water bottling consents to be reconsidered. <clears throat> Cloud Ocean Water, 4.32 million litres a day take, and the Rapaki Natural Resources, 24 million litre a day water bottling project. It was announced in November that in Mutapala is planned to take in 18 million litres a day, 60% of the aquifer for bottling and export. There are still information gaps about our aquifers and the, that gap needs to be filled before we continue to sign off any more large takes. It is one thing to use water that remains in our water cycle. It's another thing to have it taken off our shores. In a world that is becoming increasingly devoid of clean water and filled with plastic products, we must ask ourselves if encouraging further production of non-biodegradable containers for bot bottling water is considered sustainable or responsible. If water bottling is to continue in New Zealand, there must be standards, non-negotiable protocols and guidelines in place for councils to adhere to. <clears throat> in the evidence provided by Mallory Osborne regarding the protection of the Modi of water bodies, she states, in the matter of the export of bottled water, which I consider is not an RMA effect, in the absence of any further information or evidence of adverse effects from Tangata Whenua, it is difficult for me to understand how this proposal how the proposal take could adversely affect the modi of the aquifer. The export of water may not be an RMA effect, <clears throat> but in some Maori perspectives, it does affect the modi of the puna, of the flora and fauna that depend on the wai, of the land that embraces all water bodies and the people who share the role of kaitiaki. So when we say we are uncomfortable about the bottling of our water to be shipped overseas, we experience heartbreak and a sense of being alienated from our tonga through the same mechanisms that alienated us from our lands, culture and customary rights in years past. Despite being left out of the decision making, Māori have ceded governance, never ceded governance rights or kaitiaki over water. The RMA recognises our environmental values, but in practice Māori are still considered second to three interests, property rights, globalisation and regulatory man management systems. Māori have knowledge to contribute to the decision-making process if it is given the opportunity. Knowledge that could liberate Western practices beyond mere window dressing towards substantial sustainability. 
Throughout the country and our own region, we are demonstrating workable partnerships. The Rangataiki River Forum is a co-governance entity mandated to promote the protection and enhancement of the environment, cultural and spiritual health and well-being of the Rangataiki River and is resources for the benefit of uh, present and future generations. The Maru or Kaituna River Authority is a co-governance partnership mandated to restore, protect and enhance the environmental, cultural and spiritual health and well-being of the Kaituna River. Their plan is due for release soon. The Rotorua Te Arawa Lakes program is responsible for restoring and protecting the modi of the 12 Rotorua Lakes through the use of mātauranga and science in order to open up a full range of solutions. So before we allow the export of water from our springs, we ask that you consider the whole of life assessment of the activity, not just if it meets the immediate requirements of planning documents and employment opportunities. This consent is about plastics and eventually replacing workers with technology. You must consider, in light of the country's bottling activities and public concerns, about whether a conversation needs to be had about the substantial allocation, bottling and exporting of our precious resource. You must consider with more foresight the long-term impact of climate change and the trends that are already signalling a much dire concern. You must consider if there is information that could offer better options, better sustainability and better outcomes. When it comes to decisions about the quantity and quality of water we leave for future generations, Napuriki believes the best decision is to let them, future generations, make those decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll see if we have questions. Yes, um, thank you very much for your submission. I've got a, a few questions. Um, one is just, you mentioned at the very start of the submission, the interests of Ngā Pōtiki o Tamapauri, and I just want to clarify it, and, and you'll know that I'll, I'm familiar with the Tauranga traditions. So um, your interests are mostly in, in Tauranga. Is there, do you have any particular direct entrance in the application site or the aquifer? Kia ora. I'll answer that question. No, we don't have any direct interest in the application yep. site. But we, we base our um, our submission uh, due to our whakapapa links to Te Ngāti Awa. Yeah, that was going to be my second question. I, I read the submissions as supporting the submissions of Ngāti Awa, is that correct? Yes. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, now, in your original submission, um, you mentioned the taking removal of water from the region has an impact on the modi of the water body. Um, and you may not have been here when we had um, our many of our iwi submitters yesterday. So we had, uh, uh, we were quite privileged actually yesterday to hear uh, particularly Ngāti Awa perspectives on the Māori of, on, on water. And I just wondered if you had any comments in regards to what you think the Māori of the water in, this, in terms of this particular application is. No, I think we'll leave that sitting okay. with Ngāti Awa. Okay. Um, you've mentioned um, cultural impact assessments. And we, um, quite late in the piece, and you may not be aware of it, we received a cultural impact assessment from Ngāti Awa, and we previously had one from, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, from Ngāti Dangitihi and perhaps Tuwhare Toki Kawara as well, so we've had the benefit of three cultural impact assessments. Notwithstanding, the, probably the Ngāti Awa one was quite a significant piece of work that we only saw last week. We received that last week, but I just wanted to see if you were aware of that. Yes. Uh, I think they followed that after we put our submission. Yes, it was here. Yeah, they just received it last week. Um, there's point four in your submission. It says discharge which contains any degree of nuisance contamination is a breach of the national policy statement. And I just wanted if you could clarify for me what you meant by nuisance contamination. According to the, um, I think the Tatawira catchment plan, I think in even. Um, national policy statement on fresh water, any contamination is not acceptable. So you're Especially meaning, in this area. So you're meaning nuisance contamination is any contamination? Any contamination. And that's contamination of the, of the aquifer? Uh, of the waterways. Of waterways. Um, to go on further, um, in terms of particular conditions that you'd like to see if, if the application was granted and I'm, I'm not sure if you were here earlier where we just reminded people that um, we're of an open mind and we haven't made a decision yet 
but we will talk a lot about conditions because we've got everybody here. So if we were of a mind to grant consent, what types of conditions might be appropriate? Um, and so I'm just looking at your original submission and you mentioned the cultural flow model. And I wonder if you could perhaps familiarise me with what you were thinking in that regard. What actually were you thinking? Ngāti Ranga he had um, developed the cultural uh, or kaitiaki flow model. Which oh, is that was for the Yawaho? Okay. Yes. I don't know what that is, so what is it? Yes, perhaps for the benefit of the panel, if you could explain what that is. Um, so I think on top of the regional council's uh, ecological level, there's another level that's added called kaitiaki level for the purpose of um, meeting kaitiaki needs. So is that cultural indicator monitoring? Okay. That flowed out of the work done in Canterbury initially. Is that in the same frame? No, no. <laughs> yeah, perhaps we might, um, if it's appropriate, ask the staff if they could get us a copy of what that actually is. Yep. We got that. Joe? I can That's see people answer. writing, but they might not be listening to us. Um, we'd, we'd, <laughs> I was just asking the, um, the submitter around what they were meaning by cultural flow model. Um, and, and they've explained that they're meaning the model used by Ngāti Dangi Buwehi, I think, for the Awaho River, and it might be something to do with the water supply or the assessments that have gone on over there. I'm, I'm not really familiar with the detail of that. I was wondering if, 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 we're, if there is a copy of a model, it would be good to, have, to see that. Um, you mentioned, um, this is at point three, remedy or mitigate either through payment or replacement of any lost resources that will enhance particular values or capacity of the hapu. In regards to payment, what were you actually thinking? What, what actually is that? We have no. It will be determined by you. So <laughs> um, payment by it, whom? It's, it's really um, reimbursement. or We don't want to really say it. You have to be careful about the wording. Yes. Yeah, there's, um, there's no explanation in the, in the original submission. It's just just the word, uh, through payment or replacement of any lost resources. Mm. And it, it, later in the submission, it, it, well, in the submission, it does say replacement means like a, a reciprocity for water taken, water is mm. returned. Uh, but it was just the term payment. Were you meaning, um, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, royalties or something like that. Is that what you were thinking? Or was it something else? Um, I think when our discussion previously to putting in the submission, I think I noted more of a mitigation package. Oh, okay. But then at the end of the day, I think those details should be determined by the local tribe. Thank you. I didn't have any other questions. And um, given all of those questions, I don't have any further questions either. Thank you very much for coming Thank in. You. And thanks for agreeing to appear before lunch. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Safe travels home. Thank you, mate. We have one more submitter to hear today, Deborah Southall. Is Deborah Southall here by any chance? But she might be coming up after lunch. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just going to... You're scheduled for after lunch, but um, and you've indicated you need 15 minutes. Is that still the amount of time you think you need? And if so, are you happy to go now, or would you rather wait till after lunch? Oh, I'm fine to go now. Yeah, okay, well, let's do that. And thanks for um, being accommodating. I think you've been sitting uh, in the back of the room today, so you've probably heard me say that we've read the original submissions. You don't need to reread those to us, but you're very welcome to highlight your key points for us. Do you have any other? Do you have any written material to table today? Okay, just go ahead. Thank you. I went to live um, at a small property with my parents and older brother when I was four years old along Hallett Road. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. But that was 60 years ago, which is a bit scary to admit. <laughs> yeah. I grew up with the Tarawera River at the bottom of the back garden. Hallett Road was known as a country lane, and it still is. It doesn't go anywhere. It stops at the end of the river. Johnson Road was known as a country lane, and it still is. It doesn't go anywhere. It stops at a farm. If anyone here were to walk down Hallett Road during the day, they would see the children going to the school bus by the railway line. They would see calves grazing. They would see horses grazing. They would see farm machinery. They would see hay bales. They would see fence and post rails. They would see electric fences. 
they would see a rural scene. They would hear roosters crying and they would hear tuis in the trees and they would see wood pigeons swooping from tree to tree. It is a picturesque rural landscape. It's a picturesque rural, quiet community. It is not an industrial site. I come here because I see the Nong Poo Springs Water Bottling Company's application to pump 146,000 bottles of water per hour of each day from the RYET aquifer is a threat to our availability of water in the future and a threat to our rivers, lakes and waterways. I also see the proposal as a threat to the lives of the people who live in close proximity to the proposed industrial site in Johnson and Hallett Road. I care about the lives of the people that are living next to the proposed Nong Food Springs industrial site. But I also come here because of the wider context, and that is the impact of this application of successful on New Zealand's natural resources, our water, which sustains our life. I am afraid the wrong decision made now during the next 15 days will impact severely on the well-being of the local residents and impact irreversibly on the land and jeopardise the availability and quality of the water resources in the future. The expert documents associated with the Nong Springs application refer to the impact on the land and the environment. This application has already impacted on the local community. It has created stress in the lives of the local people since it became public knowledge. I grew up in a beautiful corner of the Bay of Plenty countryside in Hallett Road. I had the privilege of growing up in a quiet, peaceful and safe landscape and community. We played in the creek, catching inanga and eels. This creek is referred to as a drain in the proposed plan and will be used as a chemical waste waterway to the Tarawera River. I see from documents that there are native fish in this creek. To my knowledge of this creek, it meanders through fields and there is no evidence of any contamination further upstream. I remember as a child seeing the Waitahi drag machinery come and scoop the creek bottom and see hundreds of eels sliding through the grass and running and catching them and returning them to the creek. I see young families who have bought and built homes in the country in good faith so that their families can enjoy a rural way of life and now they are faced with an industrial site at their back door. It is wrong on many fronts. I believe this proposal is about also about values. How we value the rural community, how we value the land, <coughs> how we value our applications under the Treaty of Waitangi, how we value New Zealand's resources, and how we value the whakapapa of the land. It's about do we think those values are worth upholding? Do we think the water is worth protecting? And do the government agencies, the people whose agencies are charged with the care of our land, our region and our communities, do they care enough to have a rigorous plan, to have a vision that protects our communities, the land and our natural resources, our water? The district plan states that the rural character of the district, district is re retained. The noise and activity generated from an industrial site with 187 or 89 whatever tr truck movements a day and an additional 120 movements of service vehicles a day um, is not less than minor. A rural landscape dotted with family homes and animals does not include a large industrial site with the associated level of activity. 
I cannot even begin to imagine or what it would look like to see that number of vehicles going up and down Hallett Road, uh, sorry, Johnson Road. I do not know whether there'll be an increase during the high demand season and whether that will look like a convoy. I don't know what that will look like. I can't imagine it. There's one way into the road and one way out. I do not accept that the noise generated by this proposed site and traffic movements can be considered as achieving compliance with the district plan noise levels, as reported in the consultant planning document. There are homes within 100 metres of the site. I do not consider that the construction effects will be less than minor. I do not consider that the industrial building of 16 metres high is part of a rural landscape. The proposed site, which I thought was five hectares, but I hear it's seven, is considered by the consultant planner as a small piece of the rural landscape. But the associated activity on the rural, this piece of rural landscape will be far more than this. The industrial site will cover that area in its entirety, and the activity continues far beneath the ground. The affected waterways stretch across the Bay of Plenty region under and overground. The proposed activities on this site reach is even further impacting on the region's water cycle that sustains rural activities in the Bay of Plenty region. In my written submission, I highlighted the implications of excessive pumping on water from aquifers. The research indicates that in a growing number of countries, groundwater from aquifers is being pumped faster than it can be replenished. This has lowered the water table with shocking consequences. Removing too much of that groundwater can change the fluid pressure of the underground aquifers, drawing seawater into coastal aquifers and corrupting water supplies. Saltwater intrusion and contamination is often irreversible. Research indicates that salt water intrusion is a global issue and one that will get worse as water levels rise. The Bay of Plenty is a coastal region. Research indicates that the ground level is below sea level near the coast in some areas of the Bay of Plenty. Before this proposal, I knew nothing about water bottling. I knew nothing about saltwater intrusion. I, I really didn't understand what an aquifer was, but I've read and looked at the, the research, the body of knowledge associated with extracting water from aquifers is littered with case studies of aquifers that are no further use for drinking water or irrigation. There are maps showing areas of Europe, North China, the United States, Canada, all with aquifers that have been misused. I looked further and read some journals of geochemical exploration. I'm not an expert. Um, but I see in California the situation became so bad they had to implement best management practices and guidance documents for groundwater sustainability. I don't think we have to make the same mistakes that other countries have made. And I think we have to ask ourselves why does Nongfu Springs, one of the biggest water bottling companies in China, want to come all the way across the world to bottle water from the, from the Awaiti Aquifer? Research indicates that drawing excessive amounts of water from an aquifer can result in reduction of water in streams, wetlands and lakes. The report prepared for Nongfu Springs by Becker Limited states that the existing well number 932 is approximately 23 metres deep. 230. Oh, I think the proposal, okay. 
the current, the current well, the one that's being used by Otakiri Spring. I, sorry, I thought the proposed one was 230. The original one I'm referring to. Existing bore is how deep? There was a typo. I noticed there was a typo in the application documents. They left a zero off one of the references okay. to the depth of the well. It's 230 metres deep. The new Seven. one's about 240 metres deep. Oh, I see. Yeah. Thank you. That's all right. Assumptions are made about the aquifer in the Becker Limited document. The effects of the proposed groundwater take on surface water is to be considered less than minor. Under aquifer recharge in the document, it states that the limited information, that limited information is available on the source of the aquifer. <coughs> However, it is thought to be from Lake Tarawera. What does this mean for the lake? And what does this mean if it is not recharged from the lake? <coughs> I believe we do not have enough independent research into this aquifer. We do not know the implications of such a water take. I believe the proposed water take highlights the effect of scale, the effect of scale of the water take compared to the current take. The effect of scale of the traffic movements, the effect of scale on the rural environment. If there is any question as to whether this is a rural activity or an industrial activity in a rural area, to me, the effects of scale of the application indicate that it is of an industrial nature, an industrial scale. I look for the policies that integrate the management of underground water and surface water in different catchment zones of the Bay of Plenty, and I couldn't find them. Whereas the recent research on groundwater investigations into catchments of potential stress from groundwater use to improve our knowledge of groundwater recharge and groundwater use. The district plan provisions commit to protect the land and require sustainable use. How can this be upheld if the underground water reserves have not been rigorously assessed? Research also indicates that drawing excessive amounts of water from an aquifer can cause land subsidence. Increased demands on groundwater resources have overstretched aquifers in many areas of the world. I have learned much about the Resource Management Act, and I've learned that it establishes a framework for the sustainable management of natural and physical resources, including land, air, soil, and water. I've learned that the Regional Council has functions under this Act. But I do not see any reference to the care, protection, and management of the natural resource, the Awa Iti Aquifer, beneath the ground. Under Section 6 of the Resource Management Act, it states, the protection of outstanding natural features and landscapes from inappropriate subdivision, use and development. I consider the Awa Iti Aquifer and the labyrinth of waterways in the Bay of Plenty to be an outstanding natural feature worthy of protection. Bay of Plenty is one of the most seismically active areas of New Zealand. The Edgecombe earthquake in 1987 was associated with renewed tectonic rupture of the Edgecombe Fault, renewed movement on the Onipu and Rotu Iti Pākau Faults and the Oawa Iti Otakiri Titeko and Omahui Faults. Cracks appeared in the banks of the Rangataiki River during the 1987 earthquake. The Tarawera River flows at our back door. 
The Nongfu Springs bore and its site is located within close proximity to the riverbank and major earthworks are planned directly adjacent to the Tarawera riverbank. Aerial images of the Nongfu Springs site suggest that it lies on an old riverbed or levee. In the early days, the riverbank had a grassy area that ran down to the river. The riverbank over the last 60 years has changed significantly. It's been reconfigured and created by man. There are no safeguards in the event of any natural disaster. There are no safeguards for the river. There are no safeguards for the local community. I'm dismayed when I read the applicant's proposal and cons consultant's reports. The term, no effect to a degree that is beyond, less than minor, is used frequently to quantify potential impact. What does this mean? This phrase appears to me to be used to trivialise and minimise concern when the consequences are unknown. Believe there is not enough short-term, mid-term or long-term scientific data, information on the impact of pumping water from the RYET aquifer available to support this application. There are no substantive long-term safeguards or accountability measures in regard to the consequences on depleting water from this aquifer. We do not know how this will impact on the region's established agriculture or horticultural industries. We don't really know what the consequences are. We do know that this application directly affects the families living next door to the Nongfu industrial site. We do know that it has implications for all residents in the Bay of Plenty region. It has implications nationally, nationally for the future. This application tells me that we cannot be complacent about our natural resources. It's incredibly urgent that a comprehensive scientific investigation, an independent investigation into New Zealand's natural resources is undertaken to inform national and regional groundwater management. It demands a rethink and a plan into the guardianship of New Zealand resources. Water is the circulating force that drives the many exchanges in a fragile balance, thereby creating a sustaining environment for life. Finally, the report prepared for Nongfu Springs by Becker Limited attempts to define the cultural significance of this area of Hallett and Johnson Road and the Tarawera River. It states, the landscape is different, modified with little remnants of the past. I disagree. The vegetation, crops, people may be different, but the whakapapa of this land lives to those who have walked on it, who understand the land, those who've grown up on the land, and those who have cared for the land and have since passed away. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Let's see if we have questions. Yeah, I've just got um, three questions. Um, my first question is, um, do you still have land interests at Hallett Road? Because you said you lived there yes. 60 years ago, and so you still... And that's on Hallett Road? Yes. Where exactly? 411. 411 Hallett Road. 411. Um, and you've certainly been, and you talked about you had been there since you were very, very young, and I think, um, did I hear correctly, 60 years ago you said? Uh, I went there when I was four, four. so. And you, you were talking about Hallett Drain, and you said it was a creek? When, uh, when it, was a it is a beautiful creek. Yeah. Um, I remember as a child we could hear the water going in th and through the culvert mm. and crashing onto the rocks. The flow is a lot less now. There's less water, but it's still a creek. It's, there's still a rich life. Was it a, me a meandering creek, or was it the straight creek that we see now? It follows a, um, 
It goes along the bottom of the property. Yes. And just it just it meanders. In the same place that it is now, or did it meander across the? No, no, it's pretty much in the same place. Pretty much the same place. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're you're residing in Auckland, yes, but that's you've got correct. still got land. When was the last time you visited the area? I, I'm here all the time. You're here I'm, all the time. I'm looking. Yes, I'm looking to return home. Okay. I spent a great deal of time here looking after my father, who was and my mother, who was very ill. So okay. I have really never left. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of your background, you did say you were you were not an expert, but what's your background? I work in education. Work in education. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. No, and, look, and I have no further questions either, but thank you very much for coming in and taking the time to present your submission thank to you. us. Thank you. So that's the end of the submitters who are scheduled to appear. The next part of our process is to hear back from the council reporting officers. We've reorganised our time frames on you in terms of having the submitters finish before lunch. Mm. So it's now quarter past 12 roughly, so how long do you need before you'd be able to report back to us this afternoon? Yeah, what's, yeah. Is that suitable to both councils? If you need more time, that's fine, just yep. don't cut yourself short. Um, in terms of your expectations of our reply, um, you're looking for uh, updates on conditions? I'm looking for you to respond to issues that have been raised during the hearing insofar as they may have led you to amend or to yep. firm up your conclusions and recommendations yep, yep. So we've certainly us. done that. And I'm also interested in the council reporting officer's latest position on conditions, particularly where there was disagreement yeah. between the applicants, planners and the council reporting officers. Conditions may not be finally crafted, but um, no, that's all right. Report on that. <coughs> that's, no, that's fine. Just yep. if you can advise us what your latest thinking is, and I'm sure the applicant will take what the officers recommend to us this afternoon and serve up to us yet another suite of conditions in reply, mm -hmm. and we'll take all of that into consideration when we deliberate. Mm -hmm. If we decide consent should be granted, so is two o'clock all right, or do you want two thirty? Just yeah, Two o'clock's fine. Okay, so we're now adjourned. Or did you want to say something? I was just on those consent conditions. I'd mentioned those earlier in the hearing. I think it was Monday around. Uh, we won't call it an aspiration, an expectation that we'll have one set and then those areas of disagreement, but also if there, where there is disagreement, the reasons why the parties disagree or the reasons why they've got their particular position, that would be helpful to us. Yes, and it, that, that occurs in some of them, but not in all of them. So that was a requirement I imposed on the applicant yes. to do in reply. Officers, if yep. you're able to identify areas of disagreement yes. and the options as well. Yep. Yep. And we'll do our best to note that and yep. the reasons as well soon and capture those. Yeah, well, you get, you get um, yep. certainly to have the last say in terms of uh, advice to us in that regard, given you have the final right of reply. All right, so we now adjourn until 2 o'clock when the council yep. reporting officers will come back to us with their final views on the matters. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.